Thank you. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, we'll start with verse 2. I want to preach to you tonight on the subject of rest and your need for rest. There was a, um, under the uh, Nixon administration, there was a subcommittee And this subcommittee uh, had actually met together because they believed by 1988, the average American would only work 20 hours per week, and the main problem in America would be too much leisure. Now, I think we can say they were wrong, uh, uh, dramatically, uh, uh, because studies have shown that leisure time has actually declined significantly since then, some by as much as, uh, some studies showing by as much as 37% down since that time. There is a, uh, in the world that God created, a rhythm between work and rest, and I want to talk to you about that. We'll start with Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 is where we'll begin. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word tonight, and I ask that you will give us insight and revelation and the rest that you desire for our soul. God, I pray if there's any here that don't know you or backslidden, draw them to repentance in Jesus' name. Amen. So this really is a sermon to myself, and if you can uh, you know, get something out of it, then by all means. But, but really, this will be one part confession, two parts, you know, uh, uh, what the Word of God has to say about it here. But you know, I am somebody that is naturally good at filling... Every little crevice of free time that I have with work, every ounce of free time uh, I have has to be, you know, I'll always find a room or a pocket of time to be able to stash something there. Yes, I can get that done, no problem, and I've got a place for it. Just to give you an, an idea of just how bad this was, you know, one time when I was in San Pedro, I'm over there, just to give you a glimpse of my schedule, I would arrive at the gym at 5.45 a.m. to teach a cycling class. Then I would get ready, have my devotional time off to my 8 to 5 corporate job. After that, I would handle, uh, uh, you know, my small digital marketing company, had some jobs there. I would lead a church. I would put sermons together, all of this. And, 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 and in addition to all that, sleep, repeat, you factor in family, running a church, counseling, meals, and all the other issues of life. And I was constantly on. And if that life sounds unbalanced to you, you would be correct in your assessment. Uh, You know, when I look at this, I'm someone that, you know, again, I'll find a place for it. I have wrestled with guilt when I'm not doing anything. Had to fight off thoughts that I should be constantly doing something. And, and, you know, some of this, it's, you know, when I was in San Pedro, it was due to adjusting to the cost of living and certain financial goals. But a majority of this was a flaw in my own view of work. I remember reading an article years ago, this was before I got sent out, and and it was about a megachurch pastor, he was stepping down, and he said he was ministering from a place of emptiness, and he had to resign. And I just remember reading that, and just being so taken back about this. How can a pastor uh, uh, be ministering from a place of emptiness, handling the things of God, and, and, and maybe he's, you know, neglecting his devotional time, and you have all of these assumptions, and, and yet when I look back, I can see seasons of my life where I, I have felt this kind of emptiness, or, or ministering from a place where, uh, uh, you know, uh, of emptiness, And that is, God built a rhythm in the universe of work and rest, and it's been said that when you go against the grain of the universe, we get splinters. Psychologists and mental health professionals are now talking about an epidemic in in the modern world called hurry sickness. And I want you to listen to how this is defined. A behavior 
characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. Here's another definition. A a malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster and to get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. Say amen or oh me to that. This is something that we deal with, and this is what I have felt, and I'm sure that this is what many of you have felt. And it is, it, it, it's this voice inside saying, rush, 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 go, go, go. There was a quote in a book I was reading, and it said, this is from John Orberg, he said, For many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith, It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. You know, there was an interesting uh, uh, um, study. I was listening to an interview with addiction expert Dr. Gabor Mate, and he was saying some things about people with ADHD, and I'm really... Uh, 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 not here to give any kind of uh, validity to ADHD or the, the many times that they'll tell children that they have ADHD, but he did say some fascinating, th- fascinating things on the subject. And he said, the diagnos- diagnosis we see constantly being given out to children and people who struggle to focus or sit still and have poor impulse control He begins to go on and talking about this is what has been diagnosed as ADHD, but then he's talking to the person he's interviewing with, and he uses this analogy, if I were to stress you out, what would you do? And he talked about you'd go into this fight or flight mode, you'd either deal with it or you'd run away, but he says as an infant, what if you couldn't do that? And you would have to, the brain would have to uh, tune it out as a coping mechanism. And he says when children are in their infant stage, they can't help but absorb the stress of their parents, and all they can do is tune out. And so their brains develop, as their brains develop, they develop with that coping mechanism. And when they're now in a place where they should sit down and focus or in an environment, their brain is constantly, this coping mechanism is constantly going and tuning out when they should be focusing or sitting still. I thought that was very interesting because when we live our lives under... This hurry, 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 this, the stress and the pressure of this hurry sickness gets the best of us. John Mark Comer in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, gave us 10 symptoms of hurry sickness. And I want you to think about your life as I'm reading this. His, his 10 symptoms were, one, irritability. Two, hypersensitivity. Three, restlessness. Four, workaholism or just nonstop activity. Five, emotional numbness. Six, lack of order priorities. Seven, lack of care for your body. uh, Escapist behaviors and slippage of spiritual disciplines. That's only nine. I'm sure there's a tenth one floating around somewhere. You can relate it to yourself. But when you think about these and you relate it to your life of hurry and the rush, that that many times you can relate to these, being irritable when we should be loving, hypersensitivity relationally, the feeling of restlessness or throwing ourselves at at work. It also talks about escapist behaviors. This is behaviors that you're, you're just trying to avoid important things, throwing yourself. This is people that can get involved. They'll binge on YouTube. They'll involve themselves in pornography or slippage of spiritual disciplines. And these symptoms, and sometimes more, come out of a hurried life, and yet, when we look at the life of Jesus, even with his schedule being as full as it was, and having people pulling on him in any, every direction, he never comes across hurried. When the woman with the issue of blood approaches him, he's on his way going to pray for Jairus' daughter, and he doesn't just brush her off and say, I, I, I'm busy. When the crowds would come, when Jesus was already on his way somewhere, we don't find him just dismissing the crowds. He, he stops what he's doing, embraces them. John Mark Comer also said that he puts on display, uh, uh, he put on display an unhurried life where space for God and love for people 
were the top priority. See, rest goes against our culture, and especially in a 24-hour city like Las Vegas. It's a city where greed, accumulation, and and accomplishment are driving forces influencing our behavior. When we look at things that are, uh, you know, uh, that make us constantly accessible. See, you know, believe it or not, the world did not always have cell phones. This device right here has made us all instantly accessible, that it's trained us, that you can get a hold of just about anyone at all times. You pick up the phone, you can get in touch with them. But there's nothing that says that being accessible 100% of the time is a good thing. But when we look at this, this has made it to where you used to be able to, to clock out of your job and go home and not have to deal with work until you clock in the next morning. Now, with remote work and, and with having emails and doing it all by phone, you go home and now just because you're off of work or out of the building of work, you're still focused. Your mind is still there. You're not resting. And now as the uh, work world has, the workforce has changed, many people are doing remote work, one of the big problems of that is, is uh, uh, the decline in mental health because you're never off. You're always on. You might have some freedoms, but, uh, uh, but you also lose some freedoms that are very important. Not only do we have the digital devices making us constantly accessible, but digital marketing experts say that the average person sees between 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements in a single day. Each of these aimed at birthing discontentment in you. As you're trying to live your life distraction-free, focus on, on God, your family, your values, as you're trying to do this, you have all of these things pulling for your attention. In Genesis 2, verse 2, it says, On the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. And our text is part of the story of creation, that we know that God created those first six days, and then the seventh day, He rested. And, you know, at first glance, when you read that, it doesn't really sound out of the ordinary. God works six days, then takes a day off to rest. But the truth is, God doesn't get tired. It's not like God works six days, He's exhausted, He needs to sit down for a little while and take a day off. God is uh, omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He doesn't lack, uh, you know, he doesn't lack in strength to where he's going to need that time off. And so when you actually look at this, it's not talking about what we might view as rest or day off. The word rest is the word Shabbat where we get the word Sabbath. And it means to stop or also to celebrate or delight to cease from working, to to stop. God stopped work to celebrate and delight over what He was created, or what He has created. And this was the rest God designed for His people. You know, the Sabbath for the Jews was a day to stop work completely and to delight in God and the life that He has given you. And before I go further, I'm not trying to mandate a Sabbath before anyone starts getting nervous as I talk about this subject here. The New Testament is very clear that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath and that through Jesus we no longer rest for a day. We can rest in the presence of Jesus at any time. But forever, uh, 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 and Mark 2, verse 27, it says, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And he was stating that the Sabbath was to relieve man of his labors. And and this is exactly, it was pointing to Christ freeing us from our attempts to achieve salvation by our works. And if this is a subject to where uh, you're wanting to know more about the Sabbath, how it relates to the New Testament, Hebrews 4 is also a good chapter to read. Uh, Because the chapter speaks of the final Sabbath rest that we will enter into as God's people. But we do, however, see several examples of Jesus retreating to a desolate place. 
of silence and solitude. We, we find others where he's encouraging people to rest. Mark 6, verse 30 to 31. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And the word rest, it wasn't talking about, hey, guys, let's go over here. Uh, You guys can take a nap, and then we'll get back to work. That word rest, again, it was talking about to stop working and be refreshed. Anytime we're talking about stopping uh, work, it it, it is not just stopping the physical work. If we relate it to us today, it's it's not only stopping uh, our physical work, but stop thinking about work. And I firmly believe that God built into creation a necessary rhythm of work and rest. And when we avoid this, uh, it has many negative effects on our physical and mental health. When all you do is work, you begin to lose who you are. You start becoming a machine. You lose your, your humanity. It consumes you. It becomes your identity. They found that people who work more than 40 hours a week have a much higher risk of drug and alcohol use. Before, uh, you know, in America, the average people were working about 48 hours plus every week. Henry Ford, as he was doing research on this, he was having many uh, injuries, things at his factories, and he switched from 48 hours to a 40-hour work week. And what he found that his workers were actually more productive working 40 hours a week than they had been working 48 hours a week. His success with the change inspired manufacturing companies all over the country to adopt the 40-hour work week, and it looks like we've just gone back. You're actually significantly less productive the more you work in this area. And you might be able to grind it out a couple weeks, but it will affect you in the long term. Stanford research paper found that people who work 70 hours per week didn't actually get more work done than their peers who worked 56 hours. It's saying people that worked 56 hours a week got the same amount done as people that worked 70 hours a week. That's a 14-hour difference. A 14-hour waste of time. And what is it, you know, uh, really, what is it about us that struggles so much with the idea of slowing down and resting? I mean, really, the idea to us, it sounds great, and and even when we are, but even when we uh, aren't working, our minds are occupied with things that we need to get done. I mean, the idea of unplugging completely is, is so uncomfortable to us. I remember talking the man traveling, and, and, and he had taken vacation a couple weeks, and I asked him, you know, is it difficult for you to unplug? And basically what I, what I was asking him is, are you like me? <laughs> and he said, yeah, for about the first week, I had trouble. It was so uncomfortable for me. And, you know, we, we have trouble even taking vacation. It doesn't feel restful. We come back, and we just feel like we need another vacation from our vacation. Because the answer isn't time off when the problem is how you spend your time on. I mean, how dysfunctional does humanity have to be that God had to mandate a day of rest in the Old Testament? And yet that's what he had to do. Take a day to rest. If we don't believe that God is at work when we are asleep or at rest... That's very revealing. It reveals who we really believe is in control. If we have trouble checking out, and and again, I'm talking, this sermon is, is confessions for me. This is something that I've wrestled with on and off through the years. I've gotten the victory in some areas, but I see myself uh, at times in here. But when I'm looking at this, it just unplugging, why is it so uncomfortable? Because I have things that need to get done. And yet any time I'll unplug and go back, you know, the world gets along just fine without me. I thought I needed to control it, and, and it's got, you know, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this. I can't unplug. And if I do it, and, and, and you come back later, you realize, because what it, what it is, we don't like the fact that we can't control time. 
Time is it's everlasting, and this is one of the reasons we have trouble with rest. It shows us how, how, how limited and finite we are. Even our days off are filled with us taking care of all of our other responsibilities. But this biblical description of rest is different. And what I'm talking to you about is different. And what I'm, you know, what I'm saying to do, I'm not trying to add anything to your already busy schedule. Listen, we are a busy and active church. We, are, uh, you know, we believe wholeheartedly in the mission that we need to be busy about our Father's business. But there are some things in your life that you can cut out and replace with rest. Because oftentimes, you know, people uh, wrongly, they, they, re- they, they believe that entertainment is rest. Entertainment is a false excuse for rest. That is not real rest, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but that's what people do, and and it doesn't, it it leaves you empty. It pushes the culture on and into you. St. Augustine said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. The Sabbath was for the people of Israel, and the first time we see it being observed. First time it's addressed is is in Exodus, after they had been delivered from being slaves in Egypt. See, when you're a slave, when you're a slave there in Egypt, you were working uh, seven days a week. Slaves don't get days off. And so as this would would go on, the Old Testament scholar uh, that was uh, commentating on it, Walter Brugman, uh, Brugman, said, Sabbath is an act of resistance. It's an act against Pharaoh and his empire. It's a way to stay free and not get sucked back into slavery, or worse, become the slave driver yourself. What he was saying was, this time of rest was a rejection of the life and mentality of a slave. It was a rejection of, I've got to work, 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 work. It was rejecting that. And and God was saying to the people of Israel, listen, I can do more in six days than they can do in seven. And he did that and he blessed them. There's an interesting fact about Israel. Israel, the history of Israel is, is absolutely fascinating. Not only all of their inventions and everything that they have done for the world as a whole, but when you look at just how many times they've they've been dispersed. And yet they're the only culture that's been absolutely dispersed. Uh, The nation has been brought back, given their land. They come together and they still kept their culture intact. And what experts say is that the reason they were able to keep their culture intact was because of Sabbath. They were able to distance themselves from other cultures by this practice of unplugging. They would stay near their their synagogue, that they would uh, disconnect work, uh, uh, disconnect from everything. That day they would come together with their community. They would have their readings and talk about their culture. And so as years went by, even though they were dispersed, eventually when the land came back, they were able to gather. Their culture was still intact. And you might be here tonight, you might have a good rhythm of work and rest in life, and truthfully, this sermon might be more applicable to you of the six days of work. But when we think about this, uh, 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 many of us have this voice of Pharaoh inside telling us to work, work, achieve, accumulate, and unless we fight this off, we remain slaves to Egypt. In the Bible, there's the story of Mary and Martha. We're familiar with it. And, and you think about this, though. You know, Luke chapter uh, 10, verses 38 to 42. I'll read it. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. What we see is Mary and Martha invite Jesus into their home 
Martha is worried about being busy for Jesus. Mary is worried about being at the feet of Jesus, fellowshipping, experiencing intimacy with Christ. And when Martha is looking for help, tell my sister she needs to help me. And Jesus says, no, what she's doing is right. When we rest, it's a rejection of the cultural belief that I am what I do. Rest, again, it requires trust and it requires us to acknowledge that the world doesn't revolve around us. That God is in control. God cares about you and your family more than you do. Cares more about your loved ones than you do. Cares more about providing for you than you do. And yet we try to take these things into our hands and even though you might say you don't, your actions say differently. When I was in San Pedro, I remember, you know, uh, having this, uh, again, I told you, at my times, I had allowed my life to get unbalanced and this was something that was, it was wrong and and each time I'd have to correct myself and and I'd look at this and it it would affect my marriage. It would affect my, my time with family and God would have to deal with me in some of these areas. And, and as this was going on, I remember 2020 and the pandemic's happening and anxiety is just through the roof. I'm trying to counsel people. Over 50% of people in L.A. County lost their jobs. And uh, right before this had happened, the city had tried to come in. We didn't have certain permits that they wanted, and so they were going to kick us out of the building that we just spent tens of thousands of dollars renovating. And the stress and the pressures of all of this are, are beginning to set in, and I'm trying to work through, and, and really what this drove me in, I, I began to read some books and began to really go into, uh, try to uh, uh, focus on deep, intimate fellowship with Christ, with taking some time during the week to just completely unplug, take my phone and put it on Do Not Disturb or put it on the other room. For some of you, that's, that's you know, I'm like, <laughs> stay away, don't, don't, don't talk about that. But I began to do that. I, I, I realized, you know what, this thing, I am addicted to this. I need to disconnect. I need time for fellowship with God. I need time to unplug and really just get alone with God. I still was faithful in all my devotions. had had plenty of time doing that in the morning. But see, time with Christ and a relationship with Jesus Christ is not just checking off your devotion in the morning. If you want to experience deep, intimate fellowship with God, it is a living relationship constant fellowship with Christ and I, I had to take some time and unplug and, and, and when we look at the other six days of creation God created and, and then every day he would take a step back and he'd say it is good and I began to look at my life and, and, and it was just spending that time just enjoying the life that God had given me the Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of Lights and, and I would begin to take that time, unplug, and just appreciate what God has given me. My marriage, my children, the, the possessions, the things that I had around me. But because when your life is caught up in that hurry sickness, all you want is, is more, accumulate, accomplish, build, and, and you lose sight of the fact that you have everything you need. I don't need any more. I have enough. I need time to enjoy what I have with God. That's what I need. Because either Jesus is enough or he's not. Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, as I close, this is the message translation. He says, are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Your need for rest. I want you to bow your heads with me as we close tonight. Here tonight I address the subject of rest and earlier I quoted St. Augustine 
Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. When you look at our culture today, it's constantly throwing things at you and pulling at you in every direction, telling you if you just have this, you'll be satisfied. If you just own this, if you just reach and attain this level, if you just have this relationship, finally you'll be happy and you'll be satisfied, but, but then you realize it lets you down and it lets you down and it lets you down. Advertisers still, they play uh, on this emotion constantly, advertising us this, this idea, the feeling of leisure and relaxation, and yet we get those things and we don't experience the relaxation that they sell us. Because if you want true rest, it is found in Jesus Christ. Because we were made with eternity in our hearts. And nothing in this temporary world is ever going to satisfy that. And if you're here today and you're not right with God, you've never been born again or given your life to Christ in complete surrender, you want to experience this rest that I'm talking about tonight. This rest found in a living relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand to where I can see it. I want to have somebody pray with you. Would you be honest before God and let us pray with you? I want you to experience this. Because I know what it's like not to have rest. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put it down. I know what it's like not to have any peace of mind. To listen to the inner voice of Pharaoh saying, work, do, do, accomplish, and, and yet nothing is ever good enough. And then I came into a relationship with Jesus Christ and I experienced rest. And you want that here tonight. If that's you, would you lift up your hand? Join this one that's already lifted their hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Others tonight, would you lift up your hand? You know, I experienced that peace upon salvation. But truthfully, as we live out our faith, there are so many things pulling on us and trying to rob us. You can feel that sense of restlessness. I talked about all those symptoms of, of hurry sickness. The quote from John Ortberg talking about, you know, the real reason it isn't just, uh, uh, the real danger isn't just us abandoning the faith. It's settling for this mediocre version of what Jesus had intended. And, and when you look at your life and your faith, the truth is, is that uh, you've lost the fire long ago. You've settled for a mediocre version uh, of the faith that, that the world has stripped you of your Christian life. And maybe your life has become about doing, 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 and you realize... Maybe it's been works-based faith for you. Maybe you've drifted, you've compromised, it's led you into, I talked about, uh, escapist behavior that you feel like you're constantly doing and, and hurrying, and because of that, you begin to binge, you, you have these moments where you self-sabotage, you, 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 uh, you're, you're doing well, but you're exhausted, and then all of a sudden, because you're burnt out, you make this wild decision, and things blow up, and you're here tonight. You want to acknowledge before God, I've, I've diverted, I've, I, I've done wrong, but I want to repent. I want to join these that have already lifted their hands. I want to rededicate my life. If that's you, would you lift up your hand to where I can see it? Be honest before God. God wants to help you. Wants to minister to you tonight. Jesus Christ is the living water to satisfy the thirsty soul. And if you've forgotten that, if you've walked away from that, or you've never known that, you can experience that tonight at this altar. You want to join these that have already lifted their hand. Would you lift up your hand to where I can see it? Quickly. Last call. If you lifted up your hand, I just want you to do one more thing for me. Would you slip up out of your seat and come forward? We're going to have somebody pray with you. Need a couple brothers to help pray. Speaking then to the church here tonight. Thank you. We are busy, but are we busy about the right things? When you look at your life, do you see this rhythm of work and, and rest? When you rest, are you involved in things that you should be involved in? 
Do you spend appropriate time with your, your spouse and your children? Do you unplug? Are you able to experience deep fellowship connected with God? Disconnecting yourself from, from work and want and desire. And take a step back and just appreciate what you already have, what God has already blessed your life with. Or has the devil stripped you of this? And you're stuck in, a, in these patterns of work and distraction. I want to take some time, open this altar tonight, allow you to come. Let's lay hold of God tonight. Believe in God. God is going to help you to experience that rest once again. Oh, Jesus, move and minister. You see the need tonight. God, I'm asking, believing you that you will help us to experience your rest. Lord, we are desperate for you. Captivate my heart. Oh, robo bo shalala mama mando robo bo. Establish there your throne. Oh, God, we are grateful for all that you've done for us. And I pray that you will search our hearts, God, that you will help us to experience this. Oh, Rain in me. Rain in me. God, tonight I pray that you will bring issues and things to the surface. That you will deal with hearts, God. That you will realign us with your will and purpose. Lord, your values. Let your kingdom come. Oh, Jesus, move upon us. Establish there your throne. Let your will be done. Oh, worthy is your name. Reign in me. Rain in me, sovereign Lord. Let's worship God together. God, we thank you. We worship you, Jesus. Sherere pe ala mama ndo robo bo sarara mando robo bo sarara mama mando robo bo sarara mama mando robo bo bo sarara mama nda God we rejoice in your goodness God we thank you for your faithfulness to us Lord your desire for us to rest God you are good Amen Amen We're going to be dismissed tonight uh, you know, this topic of rest is something that has been important to me. This is not an excuse for people to pull away from, from God or the things of God. You know, when we come here to church, these are things that refuel us. These are things that lift us. They build us our, our spirit. They give us rest. And these are things that we need. But there's so much out there that tries to consume our time. Things are not as important, uh, don't have the importance that we place on them. And so, I would encourage you, uh, consider your life, consider your, your time. Time is precious, and so we're going to be dismissed tonight as we bow our heads. Tarek, why don't you dismiss us in prayer?